you guys are in for a, I think, a fantastic treat. This is uh, one of the best conversations i've had in a long time and unfortunately you guys aren't going to get all of it because we started we started uh connecting immediately and it's been it's been a lot of fun and so i'm excited to have elaine kulati on the show today uh elaine kulati is a real estate developer interior designer farmer serial serial entrepreneur since the age of 14 and elaine is also one of the stars in this year's season of the undercover billionaire and i'm going to show you a clip shortly but i want to bring her on because she's a lot of fun elaine kulati welcome to the show hi thank you for thank you for having me on i'm really excited to talk to you i'm all excited right. to talk to your your peeps too <laughs> my peeps, peeps. I love it. Peeps. Uh, <laughs> all right so so uh we were talking and you mentioned that this undercover billionaire kind of happened because of the pandemic. So talk about the undercover billionaire and the premise for your particular episode. Wow. Um, okay. So I did, I was kind of secretly telling you that there's, first of all, I think people of, um, you know, affluence should strip it down every now and then I, um, personally come from, you know, a work until you drop middle-class mentality family. Like we never could even survive without a job. My dad would not allow it. I think I got my first job when I was probably 14 and it really wasn't a job. I made up something to do. Um, that being said, never having a job does create a serial entrepreneur because you're always trying to figure out how to get to the next step. And the undercover billionaire thing this year for the first, for the second season has opened up to not necessarily being a billionaire. It has nothing to do with that. None of us on the show. It's about people that can start something from nothing that have a history of, you know, Siri, somebody like myself, it's giving a platform and a rise to a movement versus just talking about somebody that um, is stripped down and taken, you know, their jets been taken away. That's not, that's the, that's not what it's about this year. And that's because of the pandemic really for me, I was scratching to get on. I was like, I, I know that I don't really fit the profile because I'm not on that level of wealth and that's fine, but I can start something from nothing and I'm not afraid to do it. And I think given our climate, there was nothing that could hurt me trying. Like, let's put some effort into making a really good situation out of something that's really terrible. What can we do? How can we pivot? And this platform gave me the opportunity and you're going to see the most amazing thing happen. I love it. I love it. All right. So let's, let's watch this clip real quick. Cause I think this clip is, is kind of cool. And some of you guys are going to uh, recognize some of the other participants. I'm Grant Cardone and I make money. I make a lot of money. I'm Elaine Kalati and I'm 100% a badass. I'm Monique Eidlett. I'm definitely not afraid of adversity. I think my whole life has been adversity. Weekends make you weak. To start over, it's terrifying for most people. I don't have that gene. I'm about to do something that is like beyond terrifying. To a million dollar business in 90 days. Fire! Saying goodbye to the fancy life. We are not in Kansas anymore. Fire! I don't have enough gas to get home. I feel so much out of my element right now. It's hard when you got money. It's impossible when you don't. Find great people that you can surround yourself with. Yes. Everything you think you know about achieving the American dream is wrong. This is a very intriguing uh, premise. It, it really draws people in because it's one thing to see you guys, you know, in your, in your, fancy environment, right? The, the, the planes, the trains, the cars, the, the houses, the, the whatever, the jet setter life, as some people will say it. But now to put you guys on the, not even the, the average Joe, this is kind of like below the average Joe and say, okay, here you go. There's like, they're giving you a hundred dollars and what a cell phone. And you got to come up with a million dollar business. Literally they, they don't tell you anything. Um, Obviously I watched the first show. So, and I, you know, through a series of, you know, conversations gleaned what they, what was happening. But I, you can't, there's, my producer at one point when I was about ready to come home, I just couldn't stand it. 
Um, she said, Elaine, there's nothing in the world that I can say that's going to prepare you for what's about to happen. Like you have to get it together. It's like, it, it's, it's, uh, it, it's, it's not naked and afraid, but it's that kind of like, there's just literally the, what are you, you have to figure out what you're going to work with and you have to pivot every second. Like, cause nothing, nothing is worse than not having anything except not having any time. Right. It's just, it's not just that you don't have anything. You have no time to get to a goal that is ordinarily going to take a year. Right. It's at least, at least if, even if you're good, right. you have nine, 90 days and it's not, it's not certain in, at any time that you're going to get there because there's at the end, there's an evaluation anyway. Like you, you might think you got there or that you're getting there, but it's, it's, I'm not a, I'm not a skilled, I'm not a skilled learned, uh, learned, I guess is the right word, um, a business executive, right? My, my idea of a business plan is on a cocktail napkin. I literally will scratch it out. So if you, if you had to say to me, what is your business plan? I work in optics. I work in, in these tranches in my head. Like this can make money and this can make money and this can make money. And I create like a little halo of little money tubes, but it's, it's not so really did I, did I get to the mark? You have no way of knowing. I just felt like I got there and I would, that would build my confidence. Um, but then something inevitably would happen that would just kick the chair out from underneath, come crashing down to zero again literally down to zero again and relying on like people you would, you would never see in your lifetime, but for this, this experience to pick you back up again, to like hoist me back up. I got you last week. It's your turn, you know, and we relied on one another. And I, I have the best team of people like these people that I met and brought together and um, cultivated and created a business with are I mean, they're individually so magnificent as a team. They are unstoppable. Like with this group of people, it can be done, but you have to find them. And it's about like trusting your instincts, you know? Well, okay. So there, there's a couple of, I think a nice little takeaways there. A, you got to trust your instincts and B, you got to find the right people. Uh, I, I think both of those things are so important. There's a lot of people out there, we see it every day or we hear about it almost every day where somebody had a great idea, but they were afraid. They didn't, they didn't believe in their instincts. They didn't believe in themselves. So they didn't do anything with that. So uh, this is going to be pretty cool. And again, just to, just to uh, plug it, it's, uh, it's called Undercover Billionaire. Uh, so tune in. It premieres Wednesday, January 6th at 8 p.m. Eastern time. Um, and uh, it's on Discovery and Discovery Plus. So anyway, check it out, guys. Uh, Undercover Billionaire on Discovery. It's going to be, I think, uh, uh, what do you call it? A great uh, kind of like Shark Tank, kind of Shark Tank uh, meets the real world because it's really, like you said, you, you're not prepared for anything. It's not a cozy environment. It's like they're throwing you uh, out there on the street to, to make it happen. But what I love about this premise is that it allows us to see how somebody at your level thinks, how you look at a situation and say, wow, that's, you know, the way Elaine is handling that is certainly different than I would have thought. And we can learn from that because I think it's kind of like a, uh, what do you call it? A, a fast track or a, uh, what do you call it? Uh, a crash course in entrepreneurship. It's for sure. That's probably the best definition that I you. I couldn't ask for a better definition. It's a crash course. It's boot camp for entrepreneurs. You know, think quick, you know, and, and don't spend so much time overreading because it's overreading equals overreaching. You have to, you have to think you're in the trenches, think quick on your feet and line, line up your goals, line up your, your short goals and your long goals every single morning. Like, like a, they're like prayer to me, you know, what, what do I have to get done today? And what do I have to get done tomorrow? And it, if you, if you can put your feet on the floor every morning like that, it, it's you when you go to bed at night, if you met those short-term goals and you're moved toward your long-term goals, it's a much better night of sleep, a much better night of sleep than a zero day. A yeah. zero day is, 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 you know, I, first of all, I can't, that would keep me up all night, a zero day. I don't believe in them. I'm like the black hole of time, you know, like, what are you doing? And so it, for me to get, to get my message out, it's that do what you think you can do in a day times 10, you know, just maximize your days because they're numbered, you know, <laughs> there's not, it doesn't go on forever. And if you, 
really calculate that down into when you have the energy to actually work like this, those numbers become even less. There is a certain point in your life, you know, the four scores of like the first 25, the second 25, the third, the fourth. And when you start to get to 50, like 55, when you start to get into that age group, you're on the back half. You're on the half of I'm aiming towards 75 where I can kind of kick it a little bit and really give back because that's your give back years, right? And if we don't all have 25 years of our life or 15 years of our life giving back, then it's all take. So you have to think about your payback to the world. And it doesn't, it doesn't really happen until you stop working and you can take the time to do that. And it's your obligation, I think, as a human race, I think it's our obligation to give back. And I always expect that out of respect your elders, right? Because the, that's the generation that gives back. We're giving to the young generation to start it off again and to keep it going. And if you have to burn and churn right through your give back period, you know, that means you didn't do it hard enough in the front half. Got to do it hard in the front half. Having kids, it's a blessing to raise children and to be a good parent and to be there for them and, you know, to really take the time. And then you, you, you see that fruit of all that hard work when they're, when they're older. My kids are like, I mean, they're, they astonish me. Really, they do. And it, that's because I hit the ground running every single morning. I never like, and if I don't feel like that, I sit myself up and find optimism in my heart, you know, because otherwise, what are you, what is it all for? What are you doing? <laughs> Set an example, get up, show them what to do, yeah. you know? So, okay. So let's talk about the give back. Cause uh, you and I were talking again before the show here and, and one of your give backs is, is the homeless. Talk about, uh, uh, cause I think in fact, Actually, you know what? I'm not going to say anything. I'll just talk about your, your, your passion for the homeless. I think that was your give back. Well, I have a, you know, I have a lot of different philosophies about it. Um, and some people would agree with me and others would not. I mean, I, we can't sugarcoat it. I think, and I do think that most people would agree that we can't, we've got to stop sugarcoating homelessness. Um, and when I say that is like, it's not a hands-off it's, it's a hands-on situation. It's not a hands-off situation. Um, that's the first thing. Don't be afraid to help somebody. I mean, um, and it doesn't, if somebody says, don't give them money, like what, it, don't tell me what to do, uh, first of all. Second, if you feel like giving someone money for whatever they're gonna use it for, if you're gonna help, help. Just don't, help freely, help with kindness, help with money, help whatever you wanna do, first of all. Secondly, please, for the love of God, try to look at people as individuals. Homelessness is not a case. It's not a group. It's not, a, it's not, it's not. They are individual people. Every single one of them was somebody else's child, okay? Just like yours, a little tiny baby. You don't know what happened to them in their life and how they got there. Also, remember to separate addiction in this world from homelessness because it's slathering over the real problem. It's layering over the real problem. And the, the addiction problems in this country are tremendous. And only there's math. It's, now, we can check our math here, but there are some statistics that say that only 2% of addiction is homeless, which means that our addiction in this country, I mean, wow, if you think about that. Yet addiction represents somewhere in the neighborhood of 65 to 70% of homelessness. So it's a big, big problem. It's a big, big problem. And we cannot lump addiction and drug addiction and drug addicts and um, people who choose to be on the street because that's where they can do what they want to do with people who do not want to be there or should not be there. Should not be there is, is a, is an interesting place because there are some people that cannot live in a closed environment from for mental health issues it, it, it's terrible for them it's an environment prison even though they're inside of a warm home and those people need help i mean they need mental health help and it's different than drug addiction help we can't lump people together so that's the first thing the second thing is we mustn't balk at all of the programs that are trying to help homelessness because it's not fair what we've done is we've created tremendous platforms to raise money for homelessness and every single one of them is wonderful. The problem is that when the money does come in, we have to be mindful of how it goes out. And that's the issue that gets this quagmire, this clogged up bureaucracy, a bad name. So what has to happen for homelessness to be solved is we have to have a red carpet instead of red tape. 
Mm. And until such time as we have a red carpet instead of red tape, until such time as we roll out what we have created and brought in, in a way that it's actually getting to the problem, we then have this bureaucracy that we complain about with the money. And this creates doubt, and that means less people will donate and less people will try because they don't see the success of it. Um, I also, you know, just want to propose something. I hope that, I hope that it's feasible, but I don't understand why we have the needle law where anyone can pick up needles. Because I know why they, it's to, you know, to keep people safer, but why don't they have to turn them back in? Mm. I mean, I don't, you know, doctors have to do it. Everybody has to turn them back in. Needles are safe um, only if they're put away properly. <laughs> Otherwise they're out in the street on the ground. For all of us, I really would really urge that the powers to be try to find a way before you issue needles to anyone that they bring you back the needles that they used. I don't care what kind of shape they're in. They need to bring them back. Um, this is one small thing that would really change a lot. Um, that's the first thing. We shouldn't give them away and then not require they bring them back. The other thing is, is I don't understand how we've allowed you know private businesses uh, to be required to allow shelter on their front doorsteps because small business, small business Saturday was last week, right? Small businesses are struggling and um, it's impossible to have anyone come in your door if they are fear fearful that they might be in danger. And if you have a group of homeless people that have you know, created an environment that they consider safe and livable on your front door of your small business, nobody that's going into the small business is going to pass freely. First of all, they don't want to trespass. Secondly, they don't want to be in a situation where they might be at harm or bring their children in. And the business owner is locked from barring or barring, barred from asking them to move off of private property. I just, we can't sugarcoat that. Right. Why are we sugarcoating that? Um, there's a couple of things I just think we need to modify so that we can really help. And I have this brilliant idea um, that I'm going to work on next year with um, one of the mayors of a really great town and um, try to build a sandbox model for um, economic solutions for small municipalities to deal with homelessness. Um, I'm looking really forward to launching it. You're going to be the first one to hear about it because I'm going to send you a <laughs> deck on it. But um, I, it's love a watching, really... I love watching how your face just lights. Uh, yeah, your face is just <laughs> lighting up like like you're talking it's... about your first date with somebody. It is just beautiful to <laughs> talk about this project with that much passion. You know, I just want everybody to work together. You know, I mean, it's like it's not. It's by the way, the numbers in homelessness are manageable. We can we can do it. You know, we just have to we have to put our heads together. Well, and I think the number one thing that we have to overcome that, that, and you, and you touched on it. And that is we get so bogged down on the judgment versus the help. And, and again, just like you mentioned, I've heard people tell me, don't give them money, you know, point them to a shelter. Well, sometimes these people don't want to go for a shelter for whatever reason. Uh, and maybe it's mental, maybe they just, whatever, it doesn't matter, but I, I'm, I'm with you. I'm going to give them money. They may use it in a way that I would not use it. Maybe they're going to get more alcohol or they're going to do something with it that I wouldn't do, but that's not for me to judge. I think that I would be judged more severely by not helping than by judging my fellow man or woman who's out there on the street. So I agree with you. Let's just help them out of kindness. Let's just help them because we can and leave the judgment to a higher being uh, who, who, I believe is in control. Uh, but, you know, to me, I agree with you. We can overcome a homeless. We can make it better than it is for everybody. As you mentioned, the entrepreneur who is now, whose front door is clogged with homeless people, we can make it better for that person. We can make it better for our homeless people. We can make it better for our shelters. And it does take coming together and not getting stuck on the judgment, but just focusing on the result, on the goal that we want to achieve. Yeah, I'm not, you know, I'm not a, not a, not, not a fan of, of being judged for my, for the way that I am charitable. I, wow. I mean, like, come on. If, if I, if I'm charitable in a way that displeases you, you know, keep it to yourself, man. <laughs> well, you know what? And, and it's so funny too, because to me, when I look at 
most of the world's problems, I think, would go away uh, if we stop the judging. I mean, you look at you look at our politics right now between the people who support Trump and the people who support Biden. They're judging each other. They're, they're in some cases violently judging each other. You look at ISIS. ISIS is all about judging us as unworthy. Therefore, we are we are worthy of death because they've judged us this way. Uh, you look at uh, again, racism is a is a judgment call. Uh, the 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 fact that women at one point couldn't vote, couldn't own property. Uh, you know, they were judged as somehow subpar to men. Uh, and so all the stuff that that, uh, what do you call it, uh, took a long time to fix or still in the works, whatever. But if we as humans could just dial back the judgment, we'd get so much more stuff done and there'd be a lot more peace. Anyway, so yeah, I mean, if you wanna judge us because uh, we're giving the charity or because we have a charitable heart, uh, I think you're, I think your your focus is in the wrong place. <laughs> yeah, I didn't give that hundred dollars away just right. I should have put it in an envelope. <laughs> I am. Um, <laughs> it's a it, listen. I uh, I think that it's a it's a it's complicated, um, but it's not impossible. And that is you know kind of the message of of um, my life and 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 the world the world out there is that it's, it's complicated, but it's not impossible. I mean, this is not an impossible situation by any means. Um, and COVID is not an impossible situation. This is a fire drill. This is a, what well, heads up, look, there's a fire and it's in the building. And if you don't know the way out, you're gonna burn down with the building and you do a fire drill and COVID is a fire drill. This might not be the number one killer, but it's serious business if something worse comes along. And we have to learn how to operate when there's a fire in the building. What do we do? Do we go down the back stairwell? Do we go down the front stairwell? Do we slide down a rope? Do we get out on a pole? How do we get out of the burning building? And without practicing a fire drill, we're stuck because everybody's running for the same exit and everybody goes down the same way. Yeah. And I really think that if we look at COVID as a fire drill, if we really think about what 2020 has brought us, we can take a whole different approach in 2021 about staying home, being healthful and mindful of people that are immune compromised and older than us. Do I wanna go around in a mask for my life? I absolutely do not, I will not, I shall not. But I will be respectful of my elders and the people that are immune compromised because I realize that it's not about me, it's about them, right? right. Secondly, do I, want to always go into my office and work and have my quiet time? Yeah, but can I create it at home? I will. I think that we have to do next year is figure out the commercial real estate market now, start thinking about what the pivots are, start pushing city municipalities and planning departments to allow commercial real estate to pivot their markets to essential business markets, allow them to have a reason to be open. Because if we don't think about it now, we could have a very severe slide in the commercial real estate markets next year. And that is a big part of our economy. We need to really be mindful of how we treat commercial business property owners, yes, right? We cannot vill villainize that business, make no bones about it. The real estate world is, it's our world. We, we have two avenues of real wealth in this country, real serious wealth. It's real estate and it's the stock market. Yeah. There's a lot of other ways that you can invest, but generally speaking, it's real estate and the stock market. And if real estate, residential real estate is going to survive this because more people are at home. But commercial real estate is important. It's very important. It's where everything is housed that we need to go and get. Everything that we need to go and get or needs to get to us. I mean, God bless Jeff Bezos and the Amazon thing and the whole like Whole Foods food delivery. I mean, what a saving grace. By the way, long before COVID, that thing was ready to go. Yeah. But what about all the farmers markets that are not surviving, all that food. What about 88% of farming not being able to distribute? Why does every location around you not have a farmer's market and a place where you can go buy local farming, especially in California, especially in Arizona, yes. especially in Florida? I mean, think about it. And why are we not on the train in the middle of the summer taking everything everywhere and back and forth? 75% less expensive than trucking. Freight, why are we not using freight? I mean, 
we got to start thinking about what's going to happen next year. And I think it's important that all the people in business, all of you people that are business minded, entrepreneurial minded, we got to get in front of what's going to happen next year. And I think it's uh, real estate and commercial, especially not residential commercial. Um, I think that there's going to be a tremendous uh, difficultness in payback. We've, um, we, you know, we've put a lot of money out and the economy needs some time to kickstart. It's like turning the Titanic. Yeah. And so 2021 will not be a payback year, which means the deficit and debt will be huge. Um, it will be years before. Be, I think 2021, to use your Titanic analogy, is going to be just turning it, turning it, turning it, getting it back. So maybe by 2022, we'll start seeing it. We'll start seeing the results of what we do in 2021. But I do want to emphasize and agree with you. We have to, again, come together on commercial real estate, not, vil not villainize these guys, but understand that, that, that if that market of real estate crashes, it's going to affect, it's going to have a ripple effect. It's not isolated. And, and, and anyway, so yeah, I agree with you on that. I, I, I think that that needs to be, anybody who is connected to commercial real estate now, it's the time to start thinking about your pivots. Yeah, what, what's gonna, and the city planners have to, you know, planning, the planning departments in every municipality need to make way for those locations to be full. Whatever it takes, what do we need to do? Right. You cannot. Again, it's not it's got to be red carpet, not red tape. How do we keep these commercial business owners and commercial business properties flourishing? And the way to do that is to make way. How do we help them pivot? It's very, very important. It's earlier for your audience. Earlier when we were talking, we were talking about you know, legal legal concepts. Um, and one of the things that I had been thinking about is like, you know, one of the beauties of being home is you have a lot of extra time really in your day. You're not traveling, you're not in your office, you're not maintaining your office, you're not paying for your office. There's so many interesting things about that. And if you could, you know, in reality, not charge more, but charge less for the same service because of the savings of those costs, you could create things like Zoom court, you know, or Zoom legal or, or a law, law, law Zoom or legal Zoom or, you know, Bob Shapiro and guys like that, where you actually fast track the process at a capped rate. And if lawyers could start doing things like that and, and medical um, sessions and, and all of the, you know, they're doing Zoom medical calls now. Um, what you're doing is you're making something accessible for people that cannot afford the care that they need, whether it's legal, whether it's insurance, whether, I mean, every single thing is being done at home. And you can't tell me that's not less expensive. It absolutely is. And if we don't pass that through, what are we doing? What are we doing? Right. I'm willing to consult for less. I don't have all this overhead. What I might as well pass it on. And you get a lot more done if people can afford to pay you. Yes. Well, and I think also, what does it say about you when you're willing to drop your rates when everybody else uh, probably needs that little drop in rate, right? Uh, our insurance company, uh, Safeco, a little a little mention out there to Safeco, they just, they didn't contact it. They just said, hey, during these times, we're giving you an extra 10% off. And it makes sense. We're not driving. Our cars, you know, our car is probably the mileage on our car has probably been cut by 60 or 70%. And, and so it makes sense for them to say, hey. Wonderful. Yes, exactly. They sent me a check in the mail and said, um, during these tough times, we, you know, we've given you a discount on your auto policy. Right. It's wonderful. You know, um, I, 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 aren't you going to remember that brand that, that is doing that? Absolutely. That absolutely. Is just stand out. We mustn't take advantage of the situation. We must pivot and make it accessible for everyone. It, it be, it's a healthy economy. It's a give back economy. You've got to give back. And I, I'm really um, happy that there are plenty of people in my life that get it. I, I've seen it. I've, I've seen the generosity and I've seen the pivot and I've seen the doors open. I've seen the red carpet, not the red tape. And um, I just want to spread that word. You know, I think it's very important. If we're going to write this ship at all, everyone's got to get on the same side of the bow. It's otherwise, it's going to just keep going. And we cannot create more debt. 
And the way to stop creating debt is to make something affordable for your brother, make something affordable for your neighbor, especially when they need help. Whether it be medical care, insurance, legal advice, general advice, therapy, you name it, whatever you're charging for, reduce it. Give up some time. Yep. Be helpful. Extend the olive branch. Be part of that party, you know? All right. So let's talk about this. Uh, one of the things that really tickled me when I saw the, uh, the undercover promo was you on that tractor. And then, of course, I did a little bit of digging. And, and here you are. You started a farm or, or you actually have a farming background. How, how deep are you into farming? I mean, do you really get on that tractor and roll up your sleeves and get to work. Talk about this because you seem a little bit, uh, how do I want to put this? You seem like a little bit of an indoor girl more than the outdoor girl type. So <laughs> that's just, that's, that's just the zoom filter. <laughs> that's the zoom. I'm an outdoor girl. <laughs> no, I, um, uh, if you've never farmed, I, I encourage you to start a farm at your home. Even if you do it on a little, there's all kinds of, you know, hydroponic, you know, gardens that you can buy. Um, and they're very inexpensive and, uh, you know, the, the classic hydroponic garden, a chia pet. Okay. Eat the sprouts. Um, seriously, just buy one for your kid. It doesn't matter. It seems silly, but you know, the, the, there's nothing like going out into the field and picking vegetables out of the field and walking up to the house and eating them. I barely wash them. Sometimes I don't actually, especially the arugula because I like it right out of the, the dirt. And, um, I, uh, I sent a, a basket to a friend of mine and, and um, this beautiful snail came out in the basket in Beverly Hills of, from the celery. And um, this, this is a client friend, sent me a picture and said, I did not know that you were selling escargot. And I said, oh my gosh, how badass is that? <laughs> the little snail crawled out of the celery. I said, that's where snails live, you yeah. know? And the snails are what, you know, you, you need them. You, they, they, they populate the soil. Um, it's just, I don't know where our heads are with dirt, like natural organic dirt, you know? Um, it's, it's the, what happened to the five minute rule? You drop it, or is it five seconds? How many seconds can it be on the ground before you eat it? Um, it really everything depends on your age, uh, because if you're a toddler, there really is no time limit. Uh, There's in building that immune system. <laughs> you know, uh, but yeah, I think it's like five seconds, yeah. There's a lot about farming that people um, can experience at home too. It's just, it's just, you know, it's a very big feeling of accomplishment when you grow something and eat it. First of all, it's also sustainable living. You know, if you're growing vegetables and tomatoes and eating those instead of going to the grocery store, great, good for you. Um, the grocery store, the grocery stores are all different. There's a lot of things in between fresh farming. Um, first of all, it can't last, it can't sustain the time. So, you know, you need to eat fresh farm to farm to table uh, farmer's market vegetables, you know, between the first and say fifth day you buy them because they don't cool them right after picking them. Um, it, it, there's a lot to know about that. And um, in between can be mixed things that have been packed and free and, and earlier cooled, but it's, a, it's definitely a different model. It's not what you're getting when you go to your favorite restaurant and they, you know, um, make those little squash blossoms with goat cheese that they just got in the morning that actually came out of the ground the day before the day of. It's different. Same with the mushrooms, the morel mush, things like that. Same day. Um, so there's an accomplishment there. The 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 heavy equipment driving. I think I was just more, you know, me trying to um, uh, get some energy out. There's something very satisfying about driving a tractor. I and I I'm, there's I can't. It's probably like driving a truck for some people or uh, flying a, a plane or getting in a race car or whatever it is that I, that need for speed. It's that kind of feeling of adrenaline when you're plowing a field. And um, I'm not a fan of tilling. Uh, I, I understand we have to plow our fields and clean. I'm not a fan of tilling only because I, I um, do think that over a long period of time, it wrecks the earth that, you know, the earth needs to regrow. Um, these things are a result of having to grow really quickly and get a lot out of the soil. Um, it, it's also because of pesticides and things like that, but we have plenty of growing space in the United States to not have to do that. Uh, if we just, just think about that for a minute and in the places that it's too cold, we have train transportation. Um, and it's, you know, it, within five days, everything is where it's supposed to be. It's not difficult. Um, so farming, I'm into farming in a big way. I'm into small farming under 200 acres, 
the 88% of farming that exists that receive somewhere in the neighborhood of 11% of the profit of their yield. So think about that for a minute. Wow. It's a, it's, it's a disparaging difference. It's that of a second or third world country when, you know, 98% of the population is controlled by 2% of the wealth, right? right? So this is, you know, 88% of the population is, is really, you know, controlled by big farming. And we have to have big farming and that's okay, but we have to be mindful of what we're doing to small farming because that's not okay, right? Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you. Uh, especially if anybody's gone out to a farmer's market and, and it's that local, locally grown stuff. And something that I learned from my farmer's market that uh, I never even thought about this. But if you move to a new location, one of the best things you can do is go to a farmer's market and get that locally grown honey because it has all the locally, the local flowers or fauna and, and it will help build immune intolerance to this new environment that you just moved to. Uh, you know, so if you're, I don't know, if you're used to the fauna in Florida and you come to Arizona, you might for a little bit have a, an allergic reaction or some kind of reaction to it. And by having this local honey, it will help with that reaction go away quicker, better, faster. And again, I just thought, man, that is so cool. It makes sense when you understand where honey comes from, right? And they're so, uh, they're, it, going to a farmer's market to me is, is, is a lot of fun. It's very cool. You get to see the same people over and over again and you get to know them and, you know, you know, their spouses and their children and you know what they're growing and, and, and it's cool. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm like you, I love a good farmer's market uh, and it's a lot of fun over time. Have you by chance um, been uh, in the you know, like Fairy Island, you know, farmer's market or places where they're more permanently installed. Have you had that experience? Yes, yes. Uh, so we have a place here that has a farmer's market uh, every weekend and it is kind of permanently installed. And, and that's where we started developing relationships with these farmers. Yeah. I think this is a really important factor. I would, I really think that it's important that they have a place to call their own because uh, what people don't realize about most farmers in a farmer's market is that their day starts at 4 30 in the morning um, when they pick and they load their trucks and um and then they get in the truck and they start to drive to where their farmer's market is uh, usually up towards a 30 miles away and then they unload all of their morning pick and they set up their tables and then they sell whatever they can and then they load up everything else and then they have to go back home and this is a 9 30 10 30 day at night right they unload what they didn't sell. They compost it, which is, you know, good and bad. I mean, we have to compost, but not what we are composting. And then you go to bed at like 10 o'clock at night and you start up the next day to do it over. Imagine the bandwidth required to be a small farmer, right? Forget about the raising of the kids and the cleaning the dishes and the cooking for yourself and the going on vacation or God forbid watering that farm or replanting or doing what needs to be tilled and mowed during the day. I mean, it's, it's an, it's an incredibly impossible life. And um, that's, that's why we need permanently installed farmer's markets where no one's taking advantage. It's nonprofit, but the farmer can come drop and go yes. and we'll sell it for you. And um, the reason for that, I think is it's not, it's not a profiteering situation. It just allows for more production. We need to let them be able to produce, make a better farm, make a better yield. Yes. Um, Critical a reason to stay in business. Back to what you were saying, we're kind of in it together. And if we're always just focused on the profit and, and sometimes gouging that profit, we start squeezing people out that we need. And ultimately it's like, we, and we've seen it over and over again where farmers just say, I just can't do it anymore. It's, I can make more money and have less stress by selling parts of my farm to the business developer or real estate developers than I'm going to do with raising my crops. I just can't do it anymore. And you, and you can't blame them because it's just so stressful for them. As you mentioned, you start at four 30 in the morning, you, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're wheeling and dealing until 10 or 11 o'clock at night. And then at the end of the day, you know, you, you have no money. There are 52 farm bureaus across the United States that represent small farming. Wow. Um, so, so to get, that's, that's a lot. And anyone can support their farm bureau. Um, there are CSA boxes being delivered all across the United States. CSA is um, Community Supported Agriculture. 
you can get a CSA box delivered. Um, those are those are supporting farmers. Uh, do not be afraid to pay more for a CSA box than they are asking. It's we need to be charitable with farming. We need to pay. There's not you couldn't pay enough for the box you're getting. It doesn't. It's not about the cost of the box. It's about the, what it's costing the farmer. Right. Um, it, it, during pandemic, you know, you would think that everybody was running out of food, right? Because everyone's running to the market and the, shel the shelves are bare. Well, listen up, okay? Small farming. The only way small farming sells is at farmers markets and restaurants. Well, Los Angeles, we have fifty-four thousand permanently closed restaurants. To give it, a, it's more than it's insanity. So now a farmer that's selling those beautiful little squash blossoms doesn't have a place to sell them. Uh, small farming was composting last I checked up to 54% of their yields, 54% going back in the ground. That's what they call the waste. The waste alone is worth somewhere in the neighborhood of a half a trillion dollars across the United States. So we have no excuse whatsoever for anybody to be hungry in this country. All we have to do is get the food there. That means it's a distribution problem. So we have to work on distribution for small farming. We have to do that for them because they're busy farming. It's very simple. It's not very complicated. We just all have to get our trucks out and drive. You know, we have to get our chains out and move them. To think of locations where people can go pick up instead of us delivering. It's not that inconvenient to go down and pick up the bag. But yeah. for a farmer to deliver it, it's impossible. They have, can you imagine what's on their plate? They got up at 4.30. They picked all the vegetables. They put them in the box. And, um, you know, if you want to pay DoorDash $50, it doesn't matter as long as the farmer doesn't have to bring it to you. Because how can they? They don't have the time. And I think right, right. they don't have the time. They're farming. They're yeah. making food for us. I pay anything for it. I, I want, I would literally overpay 10 times to eat well. I love good food. Absolutely. It's so, you know what? It's so funny you should say that. Uh, right now, people are paying, are overpaying to eat bad food, right? Heavily processed. And you mentioned DoorDash. They're having to heavily process terrible food delivered to them. So they're paying for that as well. And I agree with you. I'd much rather pay 10 times for good locally sourced food that's going to actually provide me nutrition than... And antibodies and, 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 and histamines and all of the things that you need to not have allergies and to be sick. I agree. And you give that money to farming, small farming. I mean, good for you. You know, that's... that's don't tell me how to be charitable. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, speaking, of charitable, speaking of charitable, it would be really great if, if uh, while you're watching this interview, if you would uh, hit the subscribe button and crush the like button. Very charitable and it's free and it's sustainable. So do that. And, uh, you know, I just uh, wanted to throw that in there. I, for, I always I, I, I want to say this is a great platform for charity. We could think about that together. Yeah, I'll absolutely. give you stuff to put up there. Right. Some, some really interesting things for people to, I think uh, as long as somebody's, you know, there's, I love it. I love the concept in my head of money coming in and going to a place where it's like in a bucket, like in a, and maybe in a horse trough of cash. And the people that are in line to pick it up are farmers that drove up there or rode up there or got up there and you're just giving it to them and there's nothing in between. <laughs> wow. It, it just sounds yeah, exactly so what you're saying. No red tape, just a red carpet, no yeah. red tape. And, and, and you roll out a red carpet of beautiful rose petals and say, okay, here, make your way up my, my yellow brick road to cash. <laughs> you know, I, I just feel like it should be like that, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. and that's, a, that's how we should do it. Like how much does it, there's this interesting concept that I'm working on. Um, and, oh, and by the way, if you know anybody who could be really helpful to me, I would be just so appreciative. But what's the, what about the concept of making vegetables and fruit? And um, somebody's going to do this now. And good for you. Get to the finish line before me. Anybody ahead of me is my hero. What if you like just take a picture of an orange and you put it on a blockchain and you give it a tattoo and then you, you know, you license it under crop coin or ag cash and that orange always costs that much. And the farmer's not subject to the yield price because it's their tattooed orange. Why not? Why can't we cyber currency fruit and vegetables? That would be so interesting. Right? Why can't we? I mean, why can't we just say, no, that's these, these cost this period. Look, here it is. It's already tattooed. It already costs that. And if the other guy wants to sell it for less, it's not that. Because we're always trying to explain why one group of strawberries is less expensive than another group of strawberries, you know? And um, there's not a reason. One cost, it, it, farmers aren't out making millions. Has anybody noticed? I mean, if they need 
$31 for the box, it's because it probably cost them $31. They'd be happy to take $61 for the box because they would actually make money for once. I don't understand why we don't blockchain it. Create a tattoo for it. That is Create so Yeah, that is so Yeah, that, yeah we could wow. do that. Yeah. We, you could get one of those ticker tapes, Bert, that's like has, you know, cyber currency and all your little cyber currencies, they could roll at the bottom, you know? Remember when they first started doing that on the news? I mean, all of us ADDers could not focus. I was like, wait, oh my God, what happened to my stock while trying to watch something, you know? It was hard to concentrate, right? It still yeah, is, it right? It comes on and... I still, like, wait, what's going on with the Dow? I just know, I just pay attention to red or green at this point. I've actually had to put a piece of tape on the bottom of my screen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Elaine, it's been, it has been so much fun having you on the show. I'd love to bring you back and, and, and maybe talk about some of the other stuff you do because Elaine is a businesswoman. She's, as we've talked about, a farmer. Uh, you are a uh, designer. We've talked about uh, a little tiny bit about the real estate background. But Elaine, I would love to bring you back after uh, maybe uh, after, I don't know, in a few months and talk about whatever new projects you're working on and also maybe get into your business background a little bit more. I would love to do that. I hope you get a chance to meet Monique. Have you had Monique on? I have not had a chance to have Monique on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to text her and tell her she better get on. She's amazing. Okay. She's super cool. Very, very cool. About very you. cool. That'd be great. Um, and if somebody wanna, wanted to reach out to you and say, hey, I want to maybe get involved with your charitable causes or support your 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 project that that uh, you're talking about, how can somebody get a hold of you? What's the best website for that? Um, definitely the best thing to do is to go on to lipstickfarmers.com. Lipstickfarmers.com. <laughs> There's a bunch of us. We're not, I'm not the only one. There's a bunch of us girls that love to farm and, and help with farming. It's not lipstick farming is a movement. You know, it's girl, it's women and farming is women and farming is important. And you know, the men in, in our lives, uh, you know, also are, you know, amazing farmers. I, I can't, I can't tell you how many Ellie has like that. He's uh, my local farming partner in Fallbrook is just probably hands down one of the smartest people I have ever met in the farming business has forgotten most uh, more than most of us will ever know about farming. Oh. Um, that being said, I'm like a business mind. I'm like, there's no point in doing this. If we aren't healthy, we need to be healthy, 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 healthy minded farmers make healthy minded food. You know, we got to feed our farmers. Yes. They're not just feeding you. We need to feed them. Um, Lipstick Farmers is a great place to get a hold of me. Uh, Lane at gmail.com. I just have a regular old email. Anyone can email me. I'm happy to take emails. Anyone that can help me with my cyber idea, I would love. Um, it's very hard to explain cyber currency, especially to the farming community. Can you imagine? The disconnect is hard. Um, but I want, I want to really try every way that there is and every platform and see what works. Um, and I will connect you with Monique because I think she's so amazing. And we speak, uh, we speak the same language in a lot of ways. Right. And, yeah. And thank you so much. Merry Christmas, too, by the way, to oh, your audience. Yeah. Well, I say Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, and Happy Holidays, but I'm, I'm Merry Christmas. Merry, yeah. Merry Christmas. I want to have a Merry Christmas. As well, and, and Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays to everybody else. Uh, Elaine Kulati, thank you so much. Looking forward to having you back real soon. Okay. Take it easy. Bye. Bye.